Warning, I'm not a lawyer. I'm going to be discussing law and some of the subtleties and permutations from it. And a simple explanation is that when laws are passed, they use the language and use at the time by the people who made the law. And this may have all sorts of quirks in the way they speak, transferring over to the way they write things. None of this is more properly examined than looking at Black's Law Dictionary 1800s versus modern copies, where they got rid of the flowery language and people objected to it because it's hard to understand what the fuck they're saying. Ye oldie. So anyway, Uniform Commercial Code of the United States is a comprehensive set of laws as a uniformly adopted set of state laws governing all commercial transactions. It is not applicable in all cases or permitted to do so because the same group of people that argues that something is only valid if it's commercial and not valid if it's personal suddenly want commercial only rule, literally uniform commercial code, to apply to personal or criminal cases. They're not applicable in a criminal court unless decided to do so by the court system because their original intent was just to regulate things and could have penalties that could be considered criminal penalties, obviously, but they're not useful in something unrelated. And they're not considered federal law. And this is where things get kind of smushed together. And I'm sorry. So anyway, Uniform Commercial Code 1-308A. A party that, with explicit reservation of rights, performs or promises performance or assents to performance in a manner demanded or offered by the other party does not hereby prejudice with rights reserved such words as without prejudice and under protest or the like are sufficient. Now if you can't tell what this sounds like or means, that's normal. It's a... You know how you have the math equation with all the ellipses and diddle-daddles and, and parents... Par- this is a parenthetically encumbered statement. It's designed to make it impossible for someone to weasel out of its intent and has the effect of making it to where you can't read the fucking thing. It's not subject to interpretation. Because these rules have a history where someone explained in plain English what the fuck they were trying to do. And it also says it does not apply to an accord and satisfaction where the parties agree to augmented or lesser terms than originally agreed to in order to settle a dispute or breach of contract. That's part of the back history for it. Accord and satisfaction refer to, we made a deal, but we both agreed to modify it. We can't be held to the original contract if we both agreed to edit it partway through. As long as that edit doesn't do something that would be prohibited in some way, which you can imagine all sorts of reasons, but as long as it doesn't do that, you're good. So what does this rule really mean? It allows an agreement to remain legally valid if most of or all of the legal components or parts of the agreement are still valid. So you can fully comply with them. But even though all of the parts of the rules or agreement in your contract are allowed to stand in court and be enforceable if you try to breach that contract at a later point or the other one does, An individual or business cannot avoid legally binding contract terms, and therefore the contract is still valid. However, the expression without prejudice or under protest or variations thereof can be inserted as a stopgap in case a mistake is made where you've agreed to forfeit your life, which is not legally enforceable in a contract. Oh, well, the contract could be interpreted as memeing that I get to shoot you in the face, therefore the whole contract's invalid. No, you can't do that. Just because you find a defect in the way a contract's done doesn't change your intent, the other person's intent, unless neither of you had an intention to go through with this, which is actually an argument that can be used. The contract cannot be enforced by either party or by an outside party. What does this mean? It is a reservation of rights with regard to acceptance of contract terms on the performance of the contract terms in the commercial setting where a contract's terms cause unknowing rights conflict or risk 
through the use of unclear language or lack of disclosure of legal consequences. Now, let me transliterate that a little bit. If you make a contract that you and another person get to exchange two chemical compounds for money because you're running a factory you've made in your backyard or whatever, and you find out by doing this you've broken some sort of law, do you still have to pay the fee if you receive the goods? That is a good question, and this was the, one of the reasons this kind of thing was created. And if by doing this you forfeit your right to have a uh, merchantability, let's say I buy uh, some compounds or some materials or tools and parts, do and, and I do it in such a way that part of the contract for this can't be enforced. Does that mean the whole thing can't be enforced? That, does that mean that when I paid for a couple of screwdrivers, if they're defective, uh, I don't have a warranty? Components where appropriate, it's partially judged by the court, have to be left applicable. Other parts of a contract have to be tossed out because they're invalidated by their very nature. If I'm subject to a non-disclosure agreement, but the person is convicted of a criminal act, I'm not legally compelled not to testify against them. And you can't do the non-disclosure agreement punishment against me. I, have the, I am also compelled by certain things to also, if you have rights, you have compulsions under the law, that, under the Constitution, that grants you those rights to do certain things as being kind of your social contract. You cannot force specific performance of certain terms that result in a loss of rights to which one party is unaware. If you're not aware that doing something would invalidate your right to something else, you can't be compelled. Declare inadvertent contractual consequences null and void if they were not intended by either party or one of the parties, if it can be shown in court. That's more difficult. But this is only valid when you overtly reference this code and you accept the benefit from a contract's terms without risk to your other rights, meaning you can't say under protest or without pro protest when you agree to something to try to just get out of it. You're agreeing that you are entering into a contract voluntarily. Under protest is allowed under certain components, and you put it next to it. You're allowed to edit your agreement to say, I'm doing this under protest, but the rest I'm agreeing to. You're supposed to just renegotiate it. And this is an old set of rules. What does this mean? It's not an automatic get out of it thing. If you decide that you're going to sign a piece of paperwork to get out of a court case to be able to be released on your own recognizance, but you put in without prejudice or under protest so that you can say, I never agreed to anything, that's not valid. You're agreeing to a sort of contract if you're claiming it's a contract. It isn't. But if you're claiming that's a contract, you're agreeing that you get to have your freedom in exchange for coming back to that courtroom. Even if that removes your, your rights to escape to you know France to avoid prosecution, that does mean you agreed to come back. This is not really a contract in the real sense, but if you want to invoke it as such, you're breaking the rule under UCC 1-308. It only allows you to make sure inadvertent or completely not legal components of an agreement or consequences, usually this is unforeseen consequences, you're agreeing that you're agreeing to this contract because it gives you benefit and you're willing to give benefit to the other individual. It's an exchange, usually. But, very importantly, you're not waiving your right to keep your rights. You can't invalidate your right to showing up in court and arguing. You can't enforce a non-disclosure agreement against me, next tell, if I'm going to court against you. That's not the same goddamn thing. A non-competition agreement can't be done either, IBM, if I choose to run my own company. That's excessive, you bastards. And it wasn't under protest. It was without prejudice. That's sufficient. But you have to say, uh, uh, without prejudice, UCC 1-308 colon a no colon it's parentheses a parentheses parenthetically you have to cite that first part the second part says it's not uh, not allowed if uh if you are doing this under uh you know agreement that you've renegotiated but you can do it in some cases that makes it much more complicated what is a court of record well let's talk about a court of not record small claims court traffic courts justices of the peace that actually do informally run a court and decide things. The judge makes his or her decision based on notes or memory from oral proceedings usually presented by the parties themselves without lawyers. 
they're not normally recorded because you've decided you're willing to go through this expedient form of hearing or court case. That's not the majority of court cases we're referring to. A court of record is a trial or appellate court that has the right to say that you're guilty of all sorts of things, whose judgments and proceedings are kept on permanent record, or very nearly, by a court clerk or court reporter for the possibility of appeal at least long enough for all appeals to be exhausted. Case law or precedent. This is decided by courts, the courts I've just referenced. And also, technically, small claims court can cause this but can't generate these. These are courts, but statutes also called acts are written and passed by the legislative body that affect courts of record. And also, law or precedent in a court can cause changes to legislation, acts, statutes, or amend them by effect, but not directly. Courts of record do not make statutes. Statutes apply in a court of record, and the court may interpret a statute. At that point, new legislative action can be taken or compelled by by courts of record. Courts of record can decide case law or precedent, and case law or precedent decided by courts doesn't necessarily apply in a court of record, or does apply directly in a court of record. So in a court of record, all laws are applicable. You can't claim that they don't have to file or deal with statutes. They have to follow follow statutes. Claiming otherwise is based on the misinterpretation that they can't create statutes. And then then when you dig in deeper, a person's claiming, well, if they can't make law, they don't have to follow it, which is preposterous. A justice of the peace cannot directly create a law, necessarily. They can induce a conundrum that causes a law to be created and have done so on a repeated basis, including traffic courts. But they don't make law. But a court of record, or generally what we normally call the court instead of small claims court, absolutely can cause case law to cause a new rule. And then it can go to the Supreme Court to do a decision, which can overrule the legislature. Or not, depending on the situation. We have a fluid system. But making an assertion that a court of record cannot be a place where you apply statutes is bullshit. Barring alternative meaning under statute law, this is true. It is subordinate to constitutional law, but can cause a constitutional law to be induced to happen or demand through system that we need to make one, which has happened. But indirectly. In the Bible, statutes are laws given without any reason or justification, which is not done normally or at all, really, in the United States. So let's review quickly. UCC rules are a set of agreed-upon rules between the states that are not considered to be applicable in criminal court necessarily, sometimes yes, but virtually never, or yes, they are. depends on which one you're looking at. And they're not technically federal law. And... The expression without prejudice or under protest, under protest being clear, without prejudice being a way to sneak it in, some of you in the comment section, doesn't really get you out of a contract that you're actually agreeing to. If, however, you say, I'm doing this under protest directly, that very strongly indicates you're protesting it. But most people who want to be sneaky won't do that because that means you're not really agreeing to this contract, so they're not accepting your signature at that point because that means you're going to protest it later. Why would they have you agree to something like that? Therefore, you don't get let out on your own recognizance, Mr. Criminal, until you agree to actually follow this. You can't put in under protest or without prejudice. Without prejudice does mean, however, that they can't violate your rights or rulings other places have created. Certain agreements remain invalid and others remain valid within this. Courts of record are contrasted with courts of not record, but generally when you refer to the courts, they're all courts of record. And, yes, statutes apply. And, yes, using the Bible term for it doesn't apply. We don't use the Bible to determine the law. doesn't matter if you like that last sentence. I'm going to stick it in. Below me. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. Good luck with that. Read up on it before you post it.